support this podcast at patreon.com forward slash Chris Carl Photography Podcast. that inspired you to pick up a camera in the first place. So how old were you when you first started and what was your reason for picking it up? Well, um, kind of a bit of a thing, I guess. Um, my father has been an event photographer for forever. Um, and even before he was a professional, he was also an amateur photographer as well. Um, so I've been around film and photography since I was born. Um, in high school, I guess it kind of began where I would just pick up um, disposable cameras and shoot really anything that I was doing at the time, be it hiking or out with friends, um, parties and whatnot. Um, and then I always enjoyed you know, bringing that disposable camera over to our local one-hour photo pharmacies and I wouldn't even bother to get the prints, honestly. I would just throw them on a disc and put them up on my, my hard drive or something. And then that just continued kind of through to college as well. Um, documenting like every party, um, just random days out of wherever I might be and doing the same thing. And then Facebook had come around. So it was kind of nice to then put those images up in a, album that I could just kind of share freely with, with my friends who were, you know, in the photos or whoever cared about my life at the time. Well, people generally always happy to see you carrying that camera, you know, and all these different things that you were doing. Yeah. Uh, it was exciting. Everybody knew if, if there was an event, be it, you know, a concert or party that, you know, I would have that camera and then that night or whatever was going on would be documented. And people were very much always looking forward to, to seeing um, what they might not have remembered. So really to dive into, there's a few sort of avenues I want to go down, but um, to start off with something quite broad, generally speaking, but why film? Why, why do you shoot film? Why do you continue to shoot film when the market is pushed so heavily towards digital? Towards, uh, digital? Well, I think uh, digital never really did anything for me. And I think that's why I never, ever picked up a digital camera and got into photography like so many others during that time. I just, I loved the vibe of film from those disposables. Um, and I never at that point took it seriously. I've only really taken to film seriously. Um, it's been a, about a year and a half now since I got a proper film camera. Um, I told my dad that I was looking for a compact camera, that Olympus um, MJU2, or the uh, um, uh, the other name it goes by is escaping me right now. Um, so I, I started shooting with that a bit, um, and really liking the film stocks that I was getting um, using along with that camera, and then. My buddies, two of my very, very good friends, one who teeters on the realm of professional photography. Um, he's been shooting digital forever. Um, they picked me up a Canon AE-1 program. And that really started the whole thing was, was that camera. Um, and all the things online from like the fine lab and the dark room, all of their um, resources are tremendous. So, you know, I would read constantly about metering and the relationship between the aperture and shutter speed. You know, for me, shooting just a point and shoot forever, getting into the realm of all of that was, was a bit much, but 
it really just kind of clicked. And so my dad found out, you know, me talking to my dad, um, he realized that I was really getting into this and he had his whole camera film gear from when he shot film professionally and that moved on to the digital thing. So he had all his Hasselblad lenses and bodies sitting in a trunk for the last decade and a half, I guess. So he gave me pretty much his whole chest of Hasselblad. So um, I've been fortunate enough to really dive into that whole medium format realm. And yeah, I would say that right now I'm all about shooting 120 medium format stuff as opposed to the 35 millimeter is kind of like, uh, I guess I can bring that along. <laughs> well, that's kind of really how I found you is that, um, so I'm, I, I work as a professional photographer, but I've only really taken shooting film seriously in the last, I guess, couple months, really. I mean, quarantine I took as a, or, or the, the lockdown, I took as a time to learn how to develop film and stuff. I, I use uh, my my main film camera is an A1, but I've got a couple of AE ones, which was actually my first film camera. And I've been fortunate enough to be um, given the use of a Hasselblad 500CM, which is obviously the, the parallel there with what you're using. And it's interesting to see how someone that actually knows what they're doing gets from those cameras. And it's teaching me a little bit about what they're capable of if you actually get the organic squishy thing behind the camera to function correctly. Why is it that you're pushed so far towards medium format compared to 35 millimeter? What's what's the difference between the two, and why would you why would you go back to 35 millimeter if you did? I think what draws me more to to the medium format is, I guess, I really like the square format, uh, the six by six, the bigger negatives, the finer detail of the images. Um, something for me, the way. I guess I see things really fits well into that square as opposed to the um, 35 millimeter. What is it? Three by two or so it's, it's, it's the aspect ratio that's, that's grabbing you. Yes, yes, yes. The aspect ratio of the, of the medium format. Um, I also just love the way the Hasselblad feels in my hands. Um, that whole system for me, I carry it around with me everywhere I go because I never know what I might see. If I miss out on an opportunity, I'm just, you know, going to regret it. Even though carrying a 35 millimeter is always a little easier. Yeah. I usually do carry both at certain times. So it gets a bit much to carry both. Um, if I were to go back to shooting 35 millimeter more, I do like some of the film stocks of 35 millimeter that you can't sometimes either find or they produce for medium format. Um, some of my favorite film stocks are 35 millimeter stocks. Um, the Fuji Suspiria 400, um, the Agfa Vista 200, which I think they do not make anymore, but you can still find. Um, I have recently, when I first started really shooting film, I shot a lot of expired film and I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Uh, at Agfa Optima 100, I believe was a stock that I was blown away by the results. It was, it was like a dream seeing the images. It was great. Have you considered using the spacers so that you could use the 35 millimeter on your Hasselblad? No, I have not actually thought about that. I did it yesterday for the first time. Um, and I was generally terrified the whole way through that I was going to rip the film when you're winding on, but actually it worked out really well. And you, basically you're ending up obviously shooting over the sprockets, but it's just an interesting way that you can use um, film, like you say, that you can't get for medium format and you can use the 35 millimeter equivalent. Um, it's obviously a compromise, but it's interesting. No, I really like the, the look if you ended up getting the sprockets in your scans or through the developing process. I, I, yeah. I really like that, that look as well. Um, with the frames. So let's talk about your, your subject choice. What, what is it that you're most drawn to when you're photographing? It, Cause obviously I find your Instagram feed has a, a real nostalgia to it. It seems like you're photographing almost a historical sense of wherever you are. What is it that you're most excited to photograph? Yeah. Um, people have told me 
that I have a style or they immediately know that it's an image that I shot. And I, I don't know for me, I don't really see myself having a particular style. I kind of shoot whatever catches my eye. Um, in a style sense, I definitely like shooting kind of straight dead on scenes. So if I come across a scene and I'm looking at it directly, that's what I'm seeing. That's kind of how I want to remember it. And it just ends up working well. Um, subject matter. I think I'm really just influenced a lot by my environment, especially here in the Shenandoah Valley. Um, it has a nostalgic feel. It's very historic in the American sense. Um, there's a lot of rich colonial history as well as civil war history. And it seems that today people are still kind of stuck in, in the past in ways the homes are all, you know, very old from the 1700s, not as old as, you know, your Europe stuff, but for American <laughs> buildings and things, it's quite old. Well, there's an old joke, um, Eddie Izzard make, which is that he's from Europe, which is where the history comes from. So I guess, I guess that's probably a good point. Yeah. They did say the sun never sets on the British empire. <laughs> so yeah, there's just, there's so much around here. Um, people with land have old cars like everywhere, even just walking down, down our street here in old town, Winchester. Um, people still have these, these cars from the, from the sixties, seventies that are just still driving, you know, they're not even fixed up at all. So, um, just seeing some old neat things. I, I just like, um, I love colors. So I, I don't really shoot black and white much. Um, well, that, that was actually a question I wanted to ask you is, um, obviously there, there just seems to be a complete absence of black and white. What is it that you don't like about black and white? Um, it's not so much that I dislike black and white. Um, it comes to that point where I see the world in color. So for me, not being able to see how something will look in black and white, I think is a deterrent for shooting in black and white for my style choice. Right. Um, I just want to capture things as I see them. Um, I'm not opposed to shooting black and white. I just feel like if I come across a scene and all I have loaded is black and white, then I'm going to miss out on how I truly saw this moment and how I wanted to share this moment with others. Right. I feel like it would be a disservice if I just shot black and white because I don't see the world like that. In terms of the film stocks that you are using and, and, and the color style that you developed, what, what, what is your favorite sort of go-to films? So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a safe guy. Um, so I'm shooting a lot of Portra 400. Um, I had shot early on. Um, my father, along with giving me all his camera gear, gave me a box of old film from, you know, 2005-ish. So I was shooting a lot of Fuji. I guess he had been shooting a lot of um, Fuji film. Um, with these events and shooting portraits. Um, I don't know if it was the expired nature of them or maybe my metering, but the Fuji stocks ended up being a little bit blue and green. Right. Um, and it wasn't like a true representation of, again, what I was seeing. Um, so of course, you know, the hype around Portra and the Kodak films had to shoot Portra, try it out. And I really liked the representation. I thought it was quite true to the scenes I would see. And then um, I think I can't remember why I picked up some Ektar, but I did. And on my first roll of Ektar I ever shot, I was blown away by the vivid colors of Ektar. Whereas Portra is kind of, I wouldn't say like punchy, but it lacks, it's very smooth film. It's nice. It's pleasing. Right. But Ektar just pops with the saturation. Um, the contrast just really hits if you've got the right light. It's very 
light hungry, which I, I love shooting in trash light. Like I'm out midday, high noon sun, you know, it's bright. I, I love that. Um, so yeah, you got to shoot stocks. You kind of have to plan ahead with what you know. If it's going to be a beautiful sunny day, I'm loading up Ektar. If I don't know the weather, I'm loading up Portra just because of how easy it is to shoot. And, you know, it's very forgiving. Are you, um, are you doing your own developing? At the moment, I'm not. Um, I guess I am a little hesitant on developing just because I'm, 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 I'm afraid to lose a role that I've shot. Um, I also kind of feel that I'm not getting the most out of my film photography by not developing. Um, I can make up excuses on excuses as to why I'm not developing. And it's really just, just that an excuse. I mean, I could, I could start to develop at any point. Um, there's enough resources. I've got a bunch of friends who are developing who could help me out and just something I just haven't done yet. Um, might be my, my living situation. I don't want to take up space. Um, I know things now are quite easy and you don't need much space. So it's just excuse after excuse really as to why I'm not, (laughs) um, the labs make it so easy to, to do. Um, so, you know, I've been happy with the fine lab out in Utah. Um, you know, they do the, the processing and then the scanning as well, which I have a V550 that I found at an estate sale that I was just really going to use um, to digitize some of my old disposable camera work from back in the day. But then I was like, oh, I couldn't possibly use this for, um, you know, when I'm developing at some point. But even then, I don't know if that equipment will produce the scans that I'm looking for. Um, so at the moment, I'm quite happy with just sending it out to a lab. Let's talk about how you've developed your eye and you, you've developed the way that you're seeing things, the way that you're photographing things. You have, um, like you say, you have this, this ability to frame things in a very head-on kind of way. Um, but I also found um, sort of um, recurring abstract uh, compositions that you do. Do you have to train yourself um, when you're not out with the camera to kind of see things? Um, or is it something that you're only really focusing on when you're actually out shooting? Yeah. So if I'm out and I'm just out, um, I am seeing things, you know, I guess composing things in my mind in a way that I might not even be aware of. Um, sometimes I am aware, um, but it's much easier to be out with my camera, especially the Hasselblad, um, where I'll come across a scene and I'll put it in my frame and I, uh, my eye will see it. And I'm like, this is going to be great. And then I throw it into the, fr- into, you know, the viewfinder and something just, it's not happening there. I'm, I'm not seeing it. Um, so I'll, I won't even shoot it at that point because if it's not looking good in that, six by six frame. Well, it's all good. Um, but then there's other times where I am with the camera and I'm trying to, I see a scene and I'm trying to frame it up. Um, I use most oftentimes it's a waist level viewfinder. Um, so coming across maybe a, a car for instance, um, whereas some might just, you know, hold it at their waist and shoot from the hip. I am trying to, to, I'm holding this camera up over my head um, this way and that way, really trying to find the right way for it to look in that frame. Um, so it, it, you got to be out with your camera and you have to play with, with the scene in your viewfinder, I, I feel. Do you enjoy the restriction of the number of frames that you've got? Obviously being film, especially um, six by six, you're quite limited uh, in the number of frames that you've got. Do you enjoy that restriction or is it something that um, can frustrate you? No, um, I actually love, I think that's why I, I really prefer shooting medium format. 
Um, there's been too many times, for instance, currently I have a roll of Cinestill, thir- a 36 frames of Cinestill 800 that I probably loaded up about four months ago and I'm only at frame 34. So, and those two frames will, that'll sit there for another month or so. So I like getting through a roll of 12 quite easily and saying, okay, on to the next. And the hospital ad also makes it easier where I have multiple backs. Um, so I can have multiple film stocks ready to roll if I'm not ready or if I haven't gone through that roll of Portra, I have a roll of Ektar waiting. Or I have a bunch of um, 24 backs, two for 220 film, um, which I have uh, a freezer full of 220 film too. Um, so that's always a possibility. So I like having the the additional backs so I'm not restricted with uh, with just the 12 frames. I always have options. Just if it's okay, I'd like to go a little bit broad here. Um, something I'm seeing a lot with my dive into the film photography community, uh, especially on Instagram, is that there is a lot of images of nostalgic subjects, Americana, old cars, old buildings. Um, is there a danger with the film community of sort of fetishizing nostalgia and not documenting the present with film? Yeah, it's a conversation I have a lot with with one of my biggest influences. Um, we we would joke a lot about the car thing. Um, I am not sure why it's fetishized the way it is, um, or maybe I do understand. Film is nostalgic itself, right? It's an old median. Um, so when you when you combine one thing of nostalgia with another thing of nostalgia, it just creates this this very pleasing sense of it. It has a real feeling to it, you know. And I think that's why people are drawn to it. I am not sure why the explosion happens on Instagram. Um, I think you know people get. Um, turned on by it, what, what they see that they then can go out and recreate the same thing. And so you just see a flood of the same images. Um, cars is one thing, but nostalgic things like, a uh, an old barn, for instance, I don't think that'll ever not be a thing to photograph. Right. That's never, I like a beautiful landscape with a barn somewhere. That's, that's always going to be a beautiful image to me. Um, yeah. It's funny because a lot of my influence had for shooting film had come from Instagram. Um, so just seeing what was being produced with film. I was like, wow. Um, it doesn't look digital, you know, I think that's why I never enjoyed digital photography because it looked almost, it has that digital vibe. You know, you can tell an image yeah. most oftentimes is a digital image. And I never liked that feel. Um, with film, it doesn't have to be grainy, but there's still something about film that, uh, that I'm always been drawn to. And Instagram's kind of helped me unlock that. Um, most of my biggest influences are from Instagram photographers um, or at least photographers who I found through Instagram. Um, yeah. Where am I going with that? Well, no, actually it's, it's an interesting point because it's something I've brought up with pretty much almost every single photographer from every different possible type of genre that I've ever spoken to It's just, do you find, okay, so let, let's put it this way in your, in your, in your opinion, do you think Instagram has been a positive thing for photography in general yeah that's definitely a touchy subject from what i found in the instagram film community um it all depends on who you ask i really think it's it is a positive um thing for the film community as a whole um i think instagram is probably one of the biggest reasons for the influx in film 
in shooting film, um, along with some of, you know, the YouTubers as well. But, um, seeing so much of it on Instagram, I think really gets people wanting to get out and shoot, or at least are open to the idea of trying film. Um, so I think it's, it's been a wonderful thing, especially for me, because I don't think I would have really been too interested in film if I wasn't seeing what I was seeing on Instagram. Um, but there does, there does seem to be a resurgence of, of film photographers and an interest in film photography in general. It's kind of a bizarre thing because we're at the point now where everybody's carrying around a digital camera with them at all times if they've got their phone in their pocket. And there's really no need for that, that inconvenient way of creating an image, I guess you would say, if you're to be completely, uh, completely utilitarian with it. Why is it you think that at this point film photography is making a comeback? I think it, it is because of that reason people take for granted that they have their cell phone in their pocket with, with a, with a decent camera that, you know, when digital first came out, I mean, we were at like two megapixels. I still have like an eight megapixel digital camera somewhere in a drawer that was a big deal at the time. And now, you know, your iPhone is taking some of the best images, you know, there are, but I think people take advantage of the fact or they don't take advantage of the fact that they have that in their pocket. You know, it's almost taken for granted. Um, that yeah. And people just want to save screenshots and memes now with their phones. They kind of forget the camera, <laughs> um, is there. So when you're carrying around a camera, that's its only purpose is to take a picture. You know, you can't do anything else with it. I think that's, uh, that's a big reason for wanting to shoot is here's this device. Its sole purpose is to create images. Um, so why not take advantage of that and use it? Yeah, absolutely. I think as well, there's um, where everything's being made as convenient as possible, not just in terms of photography, but literally you're living life in, in a lot of cases in America, Canada, in, in mainland Europe, in, in the UK, a lot of your life has been kind of boiled down to being very simple processes. A lot of it's taken out of your hands by computers and whatnot. And people are, um, I think in need of something kind of crafty and something they can do with their hands and something that they have to make themselves, um, as a way of kind of exercising that part of the brain and, and getting some enjoyment out of things that isn't just the process happens because you press a button. Yeah, that's interesting. I think us living through, I'm, I'm an 80s baby. So, you know, living through all these different changes, technological, um, seeing how things have changed and everything's become so much easier for you. Um, your brain becomes almost like complicit in ways. So when, when you pick up something that kind of challenges you to see things a little different, to to capture things in the moment. I think that's a, a bit of a turn on for a lot of people. It's almost like some of us eighties babies, even younger or early nineties who remember we might be going through some type of like quarter life crisis where we kind of want to remember our childhood in a way. So film might be one of those ways to kind of reconnect to your childhood or remember the world as it was. With your work, what is it that you're trying to say? What's the emotional reaction you're looking for from your photography? I like to say that um, my intent is for your delight, but uh, you know, I'm not really ever thinking of anyone ever seeing any of my images. I mean, I'm not ever happy with a lot of what I shoot ever. And then the ones that I share that I think aren't great are great. And then, well, um, and then the ones that I love, you know, they don't get received as well as I thought they would. And I don't like that, uh, that that's kind of a barometer, you know, right? how an image is by its likes it gets. Um, really, if you, if you like it, that's, that's all that really matters. Um, 
But uh, can you repeat your question? Because I don't think I answered that with that. Well, it's just the emotional reaction you're looking for from from the audience that that sees your pictures. Yeah, um, the emotional response. Yeah, I just want people to just have a pleasant moment um, when when looking at an image of mine. Something you know more relaxing and. Yeah. I, I've never thought about that before, about the, the reaction emotionally I would get from an image that I, that I would share with my audience. But uh, I do have a habit of, of asking incredibly broad questions and catching people off guard. So I do apologize. I'm going to do that again, though, um, now, if that's OK. Um, yeah, no, it's I'm a becoming, great question. Well, something I'm becoming more and more fascinated with is, is kind of... Um, uh, so I've I've taught workshops in the past um, on portraiture, on weddings and such. And um, a question that I get asked quite a lot is like, how do you how do you improve what you're doing quickly as opposed to just sort of like that slow burn, that slow grind? How do you speed up the the grind? And and I always say that self hatred is a fantastic way of improving because if you start to like your work too much you're not going to be striving to improve and you know constantly wanting to get away from what you currently don't like about what you're doing is is a really good um a really good motivator i guess and a question i've been asking a lot of photographers is um and i'm going to ask you what is your worst habit as a photographer um (laughs) that's going to go back to the instagram thing i think is is following trends i would say shooting just because you think something's going to look pretty good somewhere else. Um, you should really shoot what you think is a great image, not what others might perceive as a great image. Um, and then also, um, yeah, don't get complicit in your work, you know, always try to see things differently. You know, when you're framing up a scene as you normally would, maybe step to the right and see how it looks from that angle. Always kind of change up. Don't get comfortable with, with what you're shooting. You should always try to challenge yourself. And I guess the last thing is, uh, who are your influences? Who, who are the photographers that you're always looking out for, for their newest work? Um, I've, my father is probably my biggest influence for sure. Um, just because of what, what he shared. Um, I've grown up with his pictures. I mean, they're in a couple rooms in my house in my parents' house growing up, there wasn't any space on the wall, but his photo. So I'm always, always, always around his work. Um, one of my oldest and dearest friends, Walter Ludzinski, he's, uh, risen before dawn on Instagram. I've known him since, about fifth grade and he's probably one of my biggest influences. He's so technical with everything he does and his photography, his eye, um, he puts 100% into every single frame he shoots and he's taught me so much about the film thing and then how that works with photography in general. Um, but some, some of my, influences that made me want to shoot film before I really, really shot film. Um, who I've come across on Instagram would be, um, Cole Donnelly, um, and Carly Palmer, both of them, their work is, is something that, that I, I want to shoot. Um, something about both of them just always has, uh, brought me joy whenever I'd see their images. I'm, I'm like, I, I want to shoot like that. And what we always try and do with the podcast is make sure people know where they can find your work. So where's the best places for people to go to see what you do? Yeah, right now, um, I'm pretty much just on Instagram. Um, the handle is at clouds of delusion. You can find me there and, um, probably in the near future, I'll do some other things outside of Instagram, you know, with a website and hopefully, see my space on or see my stuff on some wall space sometime. It's been amazing to talk to you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah. I appreciate you reaching out to me. This is wonderful. Your questions are, are amazing. I look forward to checking out more of your podcast.